I'm so excited about what God is doing through our church and, and, and I'm excited about the direction of this vision. We are talking about Zoe, the God kind of life, all year long. And that is, uh, I've heard lots of sermons preached on that in my life. And and I'm going to be honest with you, I I was a little uneasy with it, and I'm going to explain that a a little bit later on. But but we're going by the book when we talk about Zoe kind of life. And so um, I'm pretty super stoked about that. Um, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of back up and, and kind of remind us of what some of the things were last week that pastor talked about, because it's only our second week to talk about this. And I think we, we, we have to continually remind ourselves of, of the vision and not just the vision, but what we're, what the foundation of that vision is for. Uh, and so in John chapter 20, in verses 30 and 31, it says this, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. This is after Jesus has died on the cross, been buried, has resurrected. And it says he, they saw him do a lot of other things in addition to the ones they wrote down. Can you imagine that? I mean, I just think about what, what is written down, all the things that are put in the book. I mean, I read the, I try, I've been trying the last several years to read the Bible through every single year, and, and, and I'm just still amazed, constantly amazed at how I'll be reading something, and I'll be thinking, oh, I've never read that before. And I've read the Bible through many times now. But there is, I can only imagine had everything been written down. It, it blows my mind. But it says uh, he did other miraculous signs in addition to the ones that they put in the Bible. It says there, but these things are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and this is the key part, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Okay. God wants you to have life by the power of his name. The, the requirement for that, the big ask that he has of you is this. Believe in him. Believe in him. He's not, he's not requiring you to do, get up and do any sort of spiritual calisthenics every day. He's not got a list that we've got to go down, that we've got to check everything off, and hopefully if we can get to the end of it by the time we die, then no. Believe in him. That's the ask. That's what he wants. Just believe. And you know what you, know what you need to be able to believe? You need to walk outside and take a look around. Because the word tells us that no one is without excuse for believing and that all we have to do is to look around and see the creation and that is enough for us to make a decision to believe or not to believe. See, we try to make it much more difficult than it really is. He's given every single one of us a measure of faith to believe. And we get to choose what we're going to do with that. So, so he's the big ask is believe. And he says, if you believe, by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. And that's what our vision is, is that you would have Zoe, the God kind of life. That's what that word life is. In the the Greek, it's zoe, which means the God kind of life. What is the God kind of life? Well, for one thing, it's eternal life. It means you don't ever have to worry about what happens. It means you take your last breath here and your next breath in heaven. I love what Dwayne Sheriff says. He says, dying was the easiest thing he's ever done. We, 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 We fear what comes right up to the dying. What, how? how we're going to die. No, that's not, the concern should be whether or not your next breath is going to be with the Lord. 
But here's the deal. It says that by believing in him, we can have life by the power of his name. And I'm looking around and I don't see anyone who isn't breathing. So we all have life. The question is, do we all have life by the power of his name? But even those who are professing Christians, who say they believe in God, I think the important question for you is, do you have life by the power of his name? And I, I know that it, it, in it, big picture is yes, you do. Because you have been saved, your spirit is made right, you have, have eternal life through God. But what I'm really wanting to talk about here is, do you have life? right now do you have the god kind of life right now and what you need to understand is god wants you to he's not trying to withhold anything from you i think in order for us to to understand why we're talking about the god kind of life we have to understand that there are are two ways to live and pastor did an amazing job last week of contrasting the god kind of life with the godless life. And, and in the Bible, you will read and you will see the word pagan. And the pagan life is a life that is godless. It is a life that is uh, completely centered around self. It is a life that, uh, where there is no moral restraint where people are shallow and materialistic, where they indulge every sensual and sexual desire that they have, no matter how depraved it may be. It is a life where they call love hate and hate love. See, the devil is always trying to convince us that love is hate, that hate is love, that freedom is bondage, and that bondage is freedom. He always takes something good that God offers to his children and tries to pervert that and, and tries to convince us that God isn't giving us something that is good. See, when God says that homosexuality is wrong, it's not because he randomly considered things that he would like to put in the right category and the wrong category. He says it's wrong because it hurts the people who are in it. He says it's wrong because he loves us so much. Because he loves the people who are in it so much. I want to read a passage out of Romans chapter 1, which is a little bit lengthy, but I, want you, I really want us to get an idea of what a pagan lifestyle looks like. And we say, oh, yeah, well, that was in the Bible. You, we're going to read this and you're going to go, wait, is that in the Bible or is that like two towns over and do you see what I'm saying? So we're going to start in Romans chapter one, starting in verse 18. Stay with me um, because it's important. And I, and I said this a, a few years ago, but I think it's important that we understand this. I'm not going to rush through this. This is the word of God. I, I, I've re, there's a whole bunch of words on my page re, right here that are mine. But these are gods, and we need to hear them. We need to ingest them and, and, and allow him to bring the truth uh, into our hearts and minds from the, these words. So in verse 18, it says this, God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. That's what I was talking about earlier. There is no excuse. Verse 21, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. Now, let me just tell you something real quick. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to stop a few times as we go through this passage. They won't worship God. But make no mistake about it, 
they worship. They worship. They worship themselves. They worship the universe. I, I, I am amazed. We were talking about this on the way home. I'm amazed at how many people I have seen thank the universe. Oh, the universe was just good to us. Uh, the universe just did, you know, is looking out for us. What is the, I mean, who, yeah. who are they t- talking about? I mean, the universe is just rocks and gas. and Now, there's a creator of the universe, and he, he, he can do something for you. But the universe, I, I don't understand that. Your ears should prick up when you hear somebody say that. And they talked a lot over the weekend about Mother Earth, Earth Day. We don't worship the earth. We worship the God who created it. So it says that they wouldn't worship uh, him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. Now let's think that through. People trying to tell us, people who don't know God at all, trying to tell us what God is like. God is love. God would never send someone to hell. Well, you're right, but you're missing some key information in what you're saying. But God God says that love is love. No, it's not. God defines love. God, God is love. And he is the one who put his love in our hearts. He gets to tell us what love is. And he's real clear about it. It's patient. It's kind. It's not boastful. It delights in justice. And God gets to decide what is justice. We don't decide that. So these people, they make up this idea. uh, They want to tell us what God is like, and they don't know anything about him. They, they, they've never read what he wrote. So they think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Parents, you better make sure that the people who are imparting to your children are not just educated fools. Because we have a a university system, a college system across this country with some of the biggest idiots I've ever listened to in my entire life. Spouting hate You better be careful about who you deem to be wise and educated. Because the truth is that there's a lot of educated fools. So it says that claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like people and birds and animals and reptiles. And you think about this. You think about the, the degree to which our culture idolizes. And what does it mean to idol? It means to worship people. I'm not trying to get up in your business, but you know, if, if you're m- more of a Swifty than you are a God follower, we got a problem. You're worshiping someone, but we worship people. And we worship animals. And, 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 and I, I don't, people, <laughs> my close friends, they t- tease me about hating dogs and cats and animals. I, I don't hate dogs and cats and animals. I just don't worship dogs and cats and animals. I don't want any dog or cat or animal to die. But I'm really sorry. I, I, I just, my, the hair on the back of my neck pricks up when I start hearing that. When the arms of the angels. Wah, wah. I don't want dogs and cats and animals to die. 
But I care more about people. And people are dying and going to hell every single day. And I, if I'm going to put my resources somewhere, that's where they're going to go. See, we were created to have dominion and authority over the animals. We are higher than they are. We can love them. We can appreciate their companionship. But they're still just animals. But it says that instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like people and birds and animals and reptiles. It says, so God abandoned them. He just let them do whatever shameful thing their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. It says that is why God abandoned them to their shameful sexual des- or shameful desires and even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. The men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserve. Why are these things shameful? Why are they shameful? It's because they go outside the the design of the creator. See, the creator gets to decide. And he had a design and a plan and a purpose for his creation. And when we operate outside of that design and that plan and that purpose, we can never have the God kind of life that God wants for us. It says in verse 28, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. And I feel like that could be the banner on the news every single day. I mean, every time we turn around, it gets more and more vile. They just keep coming up with new ways to to rebel against God. It says they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. People who are living outside God's design and God's plan and God's purpose are always trying to recruit other people to live outside of God's plan and His purpose. Why? Because it makes them feel better about themselves. And they call that mercy. And it's not mercy. It's the opposite of mercy. It's murder is what it is. Because they are getting people... To, to line up with something that is going to destroy them. And this is a picture. It's not my picture. I didn't write any of that. God did. It's a picture of the pagan lifestyle. And here's what you need to know. Paganism is alive and well in the United States of America. And the modern day pagans are coming after you and your children and your grandchildren. And they make no apologies for it. No apologies. That's the title for today. No apologies. And here's why. Because this is what I've decided. This is where I've landed. They make no apologies. I will make no apologies. I will make no apologies. Modern day pagans are gaslighters. You know what a gaslighter is? It's somebody who accuses you of doing the very thing that they are doing. So they say you are hateful when they are being hateful. They say you don't love people when it is they who don't love people. They say they are merciful when it is they who are unmerciful. 
They accuse Christian people of doing the very things that they themselves are guilty of. And they do that in an attempt to shame you and embarrass you enough that you'll stay silent. That when the time comes to stand, you will keep your seat. Not because you don't believe in God, not because you aren't on his side, but because you're afraid of what it might look like if you stand yourself up out of your seat and say, I agree with God. So we are going to learn over this next year what it means to truly, truly live a God kind of life. See, we can't have a God kind of life and be wishy-washy about what we believe. And we have got to reach the point where we are as bold and as loud as our opposition. We don't hate our opposition, but we hate what God hates and we love what God loves. And we don't apologize for it. The people who are modern day pagans make no apologies. They're gaslighters. They accuse Christians of being anti-science while they deny basic biology. And they do it with a straight face. I don't even know how they do it with a straight face, but they do it unapologetically. The people who are the modern day pagans have been making wild and very specific projections about the environment for over 50 years. I'm not talking about generalized things. I'm saying there are people who have been at the forefront of the the climate change and before it was climate change, the global warming. I mean, they've had several names for it, but the people who are at the forefront of it have, have made projections at different times over the years and they will say 15 years from now, the polar ice caps will be completely gone. 15 years later, the polar ice caps are, are not gone. They make no apologies for having just prophesied something that didn't come true. In the Bible, when, when, when you prophesy something and then it doesn't happen, you're a false prophet. Yeah. That's what these people are. Yeah, yeah. They make these projections and no one holds them to account. And, they, and still they don't apologize. They openly believe and state that you as parents should not have the final say over your children's lives. You don't get to decide what they do and don't do. Unless it goes along with their sick and depraved agenda. You don't get to decide. Be careful when you say it takes a village. Because, you know, it wasn't a, a godly person who said it takes a village. <laughs> and I've heard lots of Christians say, you know, it takes a village. Well, I'm not saying we don't lock arms with one another. I mean, I, I run a, a Christian school. I want to help and lock arms and, and work alongside of parents to achieve a common agenda. But I, I've never said it takes a village to raise my child. Why? Because I am solely responsible for my children. Rick and I will stand before God one day and he's not going to ask us what somebody else did in regards to our kids. He's going to ask us. But they believe that, that, that you are allowed to parent your children as long as you agree with their agenda. And if you don't, they get to swoop in, take over, and indoctrinate your children with godlessness, and they make no apologies for it. If you don't agree with, with, with their depraved ideas about sex and gender and, and entertainment, then you don't get to parent your children. They smugly and arrogantly promote social welfare problems or programs that that actually perpetuate poverty. And they perpetuate dependence on the government and they make no apologies. They promote governmental ideologies that create an elitist system. 
And they, they, they talk about their great compassion for, for people. And they, they, they want, a, want a government run that will enslave the people to the government. And they make no apologies. Here's what you got to know. It looks bad out there, but I love what Pastor said. We've got the answers. When I get to thinking about all the stuff, I just, I just go inside my head and I just start hearing Andre Crouch. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. We're not, we're not without hope. We are not without hope. We don't make apologies anymore. We stand on the hope that we have. But there's nothing new under the sun. Satan's not doing anything new. He is not doing anything new. A matter of fact, here's what's great about the time that we live in is this. There's a remnant. And, and you're it. We're it. You know, I was thinking about this earlier. 500 years from now, when somebody's writing in history books, I, I, I wonder what they will say about the remnant there in southwest Missouri. Yeah. Close to Hurley. Yeah. You just can't believe what God did through that remnant. Man, it looked bad. It looked bad. And, and they had, the, the enemy was all around them. But God opened their eyes and they knew that there was more with them than was against them. And they didn't make any apologies for standing with God. We have to understand the pagan lifestyle to be able to then contrast that to what God wants for us. And some of y'all are sitting here going, well, I'm all about the God kind of lifestyle. I'm not a pagan. I'm not trying to do... I'm just telling you, we need to ask ourselves some hard questions. Are you actually living the God kind of life? In every part of your life? Don't answer that quickly. You need to ask yourself some hard questions. If you are not, then there's a good chance that you're deceiving yourself, that you're compromising in some area, that you're committing adultery on God. He's a jealous God. He's jealous for you. He doesn't want to share you with the world. Are you committing adultery with the culture? Maybe you're not even doing it intentionally or consciously. But we still are responsible for that. And we've got to ask ourselves the hard questions. Are you being slowly conditioned to minimize the things that God hates in your heart? I, I'm starting to recognize in my own life just in the last few weeks as we've been studying this Zoe, God kind of life, that even though it's been unintentional, I've bowed to culture in some areas because I've allowed myself to be conditioned to overlook some things. To just overlook things and think that's just the way it is now. I, I just have to overlook things. I mean, what business out there isn't hanging a rainbow flag? What business out there isn't doing something that's anti-godly. So I, I, I'm seeing in my own heart and my life that I've, I've been unintentionally conditioned to overlook some things that God really hates. But here's the revelation that I had over the last few weeks from God is number one, that, that I'm doing some things that I, I need some correction about. But the other thing he's revealed to me is when I think about the God kind of life, here's what I know. I want it all. I don't want a little bit of it. I don't want to taste. I want to eat the whole pie. I want it all. And I'm not going to make any apologies about it. I, here's the hard part. This is the part that some people don't get, but I think you should. You need to know this. And Pastor kind of alluded to this too. Here's what you need to know. I'm not praying for it. I'm not praying for it. 
I'm, I don't have to. I'm going after it. I am going after it. And here's, here's, here's why I'm going after it. Because I know how to get it. I know how to get it. And if you don't know how to get it, you, if you'll just set your, in your heart and your mind that you're going to learn how to get it this year, you'll get it. And you'll begin to, 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 to think about your life and you'll look around and be like, oh, what in the world? How did I get here? Everything's different and it didn't. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by... Loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land, long in the, land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, so this is Old Testament. So the, the word life there is not zoe, because zoe is Greek. The Old Testament is Hebrew. But the word there is H-A-Y. It's not said hey. It's hi. I know this because I looked up Blue Letter Bible and I had them pronounce it for me. And it's hi. Just if you'll just do that, it'll you'll get close. Um, but that word means the same thing as Zoe. It's a God kind of life. It's here, and, and here's what's interesting. This is the. Um, Oh, I can't remember which Bible dictionary it is from, but this is the Bible dictionary uh, definition of that word. It says, welfare and happiness in the king's presence. Welfare and happiness in the king's presence. Welfare means your needs are met. You are taken care of. And happiness in the king's presence. It's not just that you're, you got your needs met, but you have joy in the king's presence. It also means this, as consisting of earthly felicity combined with spiritual blessings. Who knows what that means? I didn't, so I looked it up. Earthly felicity just means that you're on the earth, okay? You're living on the earth, but you are living with the spiritual blessings of God on your life. So what it's saying is you don't have to die to live the God kind of life. It's for you right now, right here. I love how, how God is, breaks things down for us sometimes. And this is, I need this because in uh, verse 20, it says, <laughs> okay, he's saying, I'm, I'm giving you two choices here, life and death. And he said, oh, that you would choose life, yeah. okay? That he said, I want you to choose life. I'm not even getting, here's two things, but I'm telling you which one's the best one. This is what, choose life. Right. But then verse 20 says, for the people like me, you can make this choice by, and it gives me a list. Thank you, Jesus, for the list. Here's the list. Love the Lord your God. Obey God. Commit yourself firmly to God. All right, the, the, love him, obey him, commit to him. Oh, I've done all of those things. Have we? I mean, I, I, obey a, I obey God a lot of the time. I loved Tim, Tim Brooks' example that he gave years ago. Um, but he's like, you know, listen, I obey a lot. He said, do you know how many people in my life I have met that I didn't murder? Yeah. <laughs> I obey God a lot. I, I only did it that one time. Yeah. I, I, I've met thousands and thousands and thousands. I didn't murder almost all of them. But, but we do that. We justify th those pockets of sin in our lives because we're just doing so well in other areas of life. 
where we weren't doing well, and now we are. So, oh, so God, thank you for just changing my life and making it so much better. And, 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 and you know, these little things, uh, they'll come around. No, when you become aware of them, you are responsible for them. So when it says to love God, that one's not so hard. But when it starts talking about obeying God, that requires submission to God. So when I start having, you know, these, these ideas or, or thoughts enter my mind that want to lead me away from God, it doesn't matter how good they feel. Yeah. See, when I'm fully submitted to God, it doesn't matter how good those things make me feel. See, Rick is a great husband, but he still irritates me sometimes, if I'm being honest. And sometimes that little thought will come in there and be like, well, I bet, uh, I bet other people don't have to deal with this. But there's somebody out there who'd treat me right. That's, that's, the, that's what I'm talking about. We, when we don't arrest those thoughts... And when we start saying, well, God is love and he loves me and he wants me to feel good, we're missing the submission to God. Why does God want you to stay married to one person? Because it's what's best for you. Not because he hates you. Not because, because it's just impossible to, to remain faithful to, to one person your whole life. Not for that reason. It's because he loves you. He knows that, that there is a maturity that takes place in a marriage. I was thinking about this when pastor said that the church, we're celebra- going to be celebrating 20 years this year as a church. And I was thinking about it, you know. I mean, we, we still deal with stuff all the time in the church. But, you know, a church is just like any, anything else. It's, it grows and it matures. The people who lead it grow and mature. And the, and, and the things that we deal with now, you know, that don't seem nearly as huge as, the, as they did 10, 15 years ago. They're the same. No, there's no, again, nothing new under the sun. We're dealing with all the same kinds of problems that come up with, that people are dealing with. But we've grown into this place where we've seen God move. We know what he can do, what he has done. And, and, and so we are maturing into ourselves. And, 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 and it's all because we have loved God. We've obeyed and submitted to him. And lastly, we've committed to him. And we've said it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what people say about the church. And people have said a lot of things about the church. It doesn't matter. God called this church into existence and he has stayed faithful to us and we will stay faithful to him. We commit ourselves to God and every aspect of his character and we don't focus just on love and mercy and grace. We focus on holiness. We take all of him because when we, when we center ourselves on one part of him, that's when we get, get off. And that's where a lot of our country has gone wrong. To know God, to commit to him fully, we have to accept him exactly the way he is. And, and we have to do that with no apologies. So it goes on to say that's the key to your life. To what kind of a life? To the God kind of life. Loving God, obeying God, and submitting and committing to God. That's the key to the God kind of life. And I want to explain what I said earlier. When we first started talking about Zoe, the God kind of life, I was kind of nervous because I've heard lots of of sermons preached on Zoe. And most of them are about material things and about how you live the God kind of life. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have all the stuff. You're going to gonna be blessed going in blessed going out you know what i don't have all the stuff 
but I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the country. See, it's not about stuff. It's not about material things, the Zoe kind of life. See, here's what I can tell you. God promises when you are faithful to the tithe that he will pour out his blessing upon you. But that's not the point of the tithe. The point of the tithe is obedience and commitment to God. And, and, and the blessings that he pour out are just icing on the cake. Because the real prize, the real reward is that relationship and communion with him. So, so the Zoe kind of life is not what some of us may have, have heard in the past that it is. I love it when God blesses people in the natural realm. But peace and joy are far more valuable to me than the biggest house and the nicest car. Far more valuable. It goes on to say this. It says, if you do these things, you'll live long in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors. What land was that? It was the promised land. What it was the promised land? It was the land of promise. It was the land flowing with milk and honey. It was the place that God designated for his people where they would live their best life. They would be blessed. And in Numbers 13, God gives us the story of the 12 spies. We're not going to read it. Um, go read it. It's so good. But the tw- he's, they send 12 spies into the promised land to scope it out and see what was there. And the 12 spies come back and they all agree that it's a land flowing with milk and honey. You just can't believe how great this place is. They even bring back fruit from the land. And they had a cluster of grapes that was so large that they had to hang it on a a big branch and carry it between people because it was so huge. That's the type of blessing and abundance that was in the land. It was so wonderful. The only problem was, in addition to all of that, there were some giants and really mean and wicked people. And so 10 of the spies come back and they're like, it's true. It's true what, what, what we've been told. It's, it's full of wonderful, amazing things. And they agreed. But they said, but we can't, we can't go take it because there's mean, wicked people people there and they're great big and we can't do that but there were two spies of the 10 of the 12 that said oh no it's it's as great as we have heard and we can do it let's do it let's do it come on their response was far different and they had all had the same experience When they went into the promised land, when they scoped it out, they were all in the same place. They all saw the same things. And what I'm telling you is there are people in this room right now, some of you are going to end this year and you're going to go, man, God brought me out. I am living the God kind of life. And there are going to be some of you going, why don't I ever get to live the God kind of life? (laughs) Those giants are really big. We all have giants. We all have giants. But Caleb's response was different than everyone else. He didn't say, let's pray that God will cause this promised land to just fall in our laps. He didn't say, let's wait for God to bring it to us. He didn't say, if it's God's will. He knew what God's will was. No, he was ready. He wanted the God kind of life. He knew that it was his. He didn't ask questions. He said, let's go. Let's go take it. We can surely conquer it. Why was he so confident? Because God had already said that it was his. God had been with him up to this point. He knew that God wasn't going to abandon him in the future. And God had never failed to keep a promise. Caleb loved God. He obeyed God. He was fully committed to God. He believed God and he made no apologies for it. And that's where we should be living. Ten spies yielded to fear and unbelief. They looked around at the culture and they went, it's too much. We're losing. 
And Caleb and Joshua said, With, if God is for us, who can be against us? How can we lose? They made no apologies. And God has made a way for every single one of us to have the God kind of life. Eternal life, yes, but earthly felicity with spiritual blessings. Live here on the earth with the blessing of God over your life. He's made a way for that. And that life produces unspeakable joy and peace, which is far more valuable than any material thing you will ever ever, ever own. And the cost of that, you should count the cost. Because the cost is loving him, obeying him, and that is no small commitment to do that. To to say, I will obey him, you've got to consider what that means, and then to to fully submit and commit your life to him. That's the cost. But here's what I can tell you. I, I, I am done trying to explain why I, I'm on God's side. I'm just on God's side. And I'm not making apologies for it. I believe the word of God and I make no apologies for it. I care more about what God thinks about me than I care about what any one of you think about me and I make no apologies for it. I hate what God hates and I love what God loves and I make no apologies. Apologies for it. I love God and I am declaring that I will obey God to the very best of my ability. I am committed to him. I am submitted to him and I make no apologies for it. When someone starts gaslighting me and calling me names, I will not back down and I will make no apologies. I will speak the truth in love because I know that those two things cannot be separated. And the devil is trying to pervert that and he's trying to take truth without love and love without truth. And he's trying to convince people that we aren't who we say we are. But we are a loving people. We are a merciful people. We are a gracious people. And no moron that has the audacity to say there is no God is going to convince me that I'm not all of those things because I am. I am living with the nature of God inside of me. His love has been shed abroad in my heart and I will not apologize one more minute for loving what he loves and hating what he hates. Matthew 10 Verse 32 says, everyone who acknowledges me publicly, this is Jesus here on the earth. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly on the earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Everyone who denies me here on the earth, I will deny before my Father in heaven. The pagans are making no apologies. They're bold, but they are standing on a foundation made of sand. Why in the world are we nervous and quaking in our boots when we are standing on the solid rock? Why? I will not back down. I want the God kind of life. I'm not praying for it. God says it's mine, and I'm going after it. And I make no apologies for that. I choose life. I've counted the cost, and I choose life life. And I know that you all do too. This is going to be such a wonderful year. And I am excited about what God is going to do here at CMC. We are a remnant. Make no mistake about it. We are a remnant, but God always uses remnant. I encourage you about three years ago when I did my through the Bible study, I I took my little colored crayon and every time the word remnant, I came across the word remnant, I highlighted it. Why? Because it reminded me of all the times that things looked bad. That things looked like, that it looked like God's people were going to be overpowered and overcome. And every time God came through for them. And so Christian Ministries Church, Southwest Missouri, we are a remnant. But with God on our side, there's nothing we can't do. Let's be bold. Let's be proud. Let's make no apologies for loving what God loves and hating what he hates. Y'all stand with me.